right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm joined by Aria Scheinbein, who is all the way over in New Jersey. How are you doing, Aria? Good, how are you? I'm doing fantastic. Yeah, and Aria has been spent over 20 years analyzing investments from startups to billion dollar companies to real estate deals, partnerships, and everything in between. And he's on a mission to help others to realize um, their, and increase their value of their businesses and their net worth. And that's what we're going to talk about today, how to increase the value of your business and net, net worth. So let's get straight into it, Aria. Um, what are what are some of the ways that people maybe hamper themselves from increasing the value of their business or their networks? And then we'll get into what they could be doing differently. Yeah, sure. So I think I'm going to separate the two things in the sense yep. that um, the net worth side is probably, let's call it the personal balance sheet, right? And the value of the business is going to be the business balance sheet. So if we, mm -hmm. we separate the two of them, we say, okay, here's our personal net worth and here's our business net worth. Now, for many entrepreneurs and many small business owners or many large business owners, their personal net worth is very tied to the value of the business yep. net worth, right? But in terms of net worth, like, hey, what you do with the liquid capital, the non-illiquid, right? So your businesses, let's view it as your illiquid asset. Yep. Um, so anything that's on your personal balance sheet that is liquid, stocks, real estate, or anything of that nature, we could talk about that separately. Let's, let's first focus on, on the business side of it, right? Um, so when we're looking at the business side of things, I think um, the first and foremost, depending on how big and how established your business is, is understanding how it operates without you what role you actually play in the business in the sense of if you disappear for a month, can the business fully operate without you or can it not, right? And I think a lot of people who get into either online businesses or you know start their own business, a lot of times it's because they were a practitioner or they yeah. were, hey, I wanna go do this on my own. And they, they fall into that category of like, they're doing all the things they're not yeah. delegating or they're not systematizing or they're not doing those things. Right. Yes. Yeah. And almost, and, and often almost seven days a week. Yeah, correct. Right. So they've, they've traded in the nine to five for the 24 right? <laughs> seven. Um, and, and it, a lot of times it's because they want to work for themselves versus, you know, work for someone else uh, on all understood levels. Um, so I think, I think that's first and foremost, like, do you have some sort of systematic process? Are there things where what I would call like a standard operating procedure, a you know an SOP, where mm -hmm. I can plug someone else in off the street within a couple hours, couple of days, and they can do this task or this role or this kind of thing. So that's number one way that you can increase the value. But I think even before I get into like tactical specifics, yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the things that I tell people really is. Um, when you're starting a business or you're in the midst of a business, um, it always makes sense to take a step back and say, okay, what do I want from this business? And where do I want to take this, right? Whether mm -hmm. I want to sell it or not, I probably want to get it to a place where in theory it could be sold. Right. And what is that destination? Whether it's a dollar an amount or it's a year away from now, but it's just like anything else, whether we're doing personal wealth building or we're doing business, you know, value dr driving, we're basically making a GPS, a you know, like a, a map, a roadmap, right? And if you get into your car now and you use Waze or you use Google Maps or whatever it is, it needs to know where you are today and it needs to know mm -hmm. where you want to go. And it's the same thing with your business. Driving the value to be higher is kind of like, hey, where do I want to go? Do I want to get to a $10 million valuation? Do I want to get a hundred million? Do I want to get a billion? And then the question, I know this is the one that everybody hates, but the question is like, why? Yeah. Like, why do you, mm -hmm. why do you want to get there? Because a lot of times it's arbitrary numbers, right? And that's okay. And that's totally fine. But the challenge is just like, if you're, if you're in this environment where everyone is just like, grow, grow, grow. Yeah. Yeah. A lot, a lot of times it's actually not the place you need to be because Typically, we have a rule called the rule of three and 10, where typically you see businesses have breaking points on the threes and the tens. And what that means is what gets you to 3 million is not going to get you to 10 million. You're actually yeah. going to basically break and mm -hmm. you're going to have to rebuild systems and you're going to have to rebuild processes and people and all these different things. And so at, at that one to $3 million level, 
in terms of top line sales, you could have a very nice, cushy, profitable business where if you try and push it to five or six, yeah. you may be making less money, having more stress. And so you ask yourself, like, do you want, why do you want to get to 10? Because understand there's going to be some pain in going from that three to 10 number. Right. So a lot of these things are, are psychological first, you know? Yeah, no, I think that's, I think those are, those are absolutely excellent points um, for people to take on board. Cause I think a number of things happens uh, sometimes people start their own businesses without any, you know, with, with maybe a vague idea of where they want to go, not even putting down, say, I want to get to 2 million or 10 million, but they just sort of, right. I want this business to, to sustain me. And to your point as well, is I think that people get distracted by all the noise around, you know, you know, exponential growth and, you know, exploding and all of that. But to your point is if you take a step back and say, what do I really want? I mean, what is my purpose and what do I really want? Maybe a lifestyle business that allows me to do more of the things I want to do and just gives me enough money to do that. Maybe that's a better path. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. Because ultimately, like some people, like they have this passion for creating billion dollar, trillion dollar companies. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And then a lot of people, like you said, like it's, it's, a, it's a lifestyle thing. And it could very well be a, a situation where what they really want is freedom, right? Yeah. They want freedom. And the business may not actually give them that freedom. They, they have the concept that like, hey, if I make enough money, I'll have freedom. But you may not need to grow the business to a certain level. You may be able to kind of like hang out at this point and have that lifestyle that you're looking for because it gives you the freedom. Yeah. And then and the other thing you mentioned there about then, uh, you know, getting into the into the tactical about, OK, so you start up your business, you set your goal, you know where you want to go. And you uh, it's very tempting then, as, as you said, to be the jack of all trades and wear all the hats and, uh, you know, think that, OK, it's helping me with with cash flow and profitability right now because I don't bring anybody else on. <laughs> right. But that's but that's not but that's not sustainable. But it's the it's the actual letting go of things that people struggle with. And then if I let it go to you, Aria, then I'm looking at, well, he's not doing it exactly the way I was doing it. Right. Yeah. I mean, that that's a whole nother discussion in the sense that mm -hmm. like the way you want it done versus the way someone else does it. Um, sometimes you'll find it actually may be better the other way. Yeah. Right. And until they do it the other way, you won't even know that. Right. Cause it's like anything, right? You were doing it, you were doing it, you were doing it. So that in your mind is the absolute best way and the most correct way. And, and until you actually see the results of something else, you may, even, even when you see the results, you may be like, ah, oh, that's not good enough or whatever it is. But if you really think about it, right, let's say someone doesn't do it right. They don't do it the mm -hmm. way you want it. Right. But they're doing it 80% correct. Yeah. Think about what that does for you and how that frees you up to ultimately drive increased value to your business, right? So um, these are just like, I know when someone hears them, sometimes they're like, oh my goodness, this is super eye-opening. And then sometimes they've heard this 60, 70, 80, 90 times, and this is the one time it hits on them. And then other people are like, yeah, whatever, that's, that, that's not meaningful. But the truth is these things are very meaningful. Um, and it just, it totally changes the dynamic. I mean, like when Jeff Bezos started Amazon, yeah, he did a lot of things, but as soon as he could get it off his plate to move on to someone else, he did. Right. And, and it's the same, like, again, doesn't need to be a, a trillion dollar company. It, it can happen anywhere. So, um, I think the other things that people, um, think about when I, when, when people come to me and they're like, Hey, I want to increase the value of things. Like, how, how can I do that? We're very people tend to be focused on one or the other top, um, side of the equation. Meaning a lot of times um, if you're a salesperson, right? Like you're in a very sales driven role, what the yeah. natural way to in, improve your business is always to think about how can I drive more sales, right? Top yeah. line, top line, top line. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times if you actually focused on the bottom line, i.e. things below, you know, on the expense yeah. side of the equation, you can drive the margins up and your profits up and your bank account up simply by, by not necessarily chasing more sales, but by looking at the expense. And I, and I don't mean to be like, oh, you know, penny pinch this and penny pinch that. But I think there are a lot of businesses out there that have things that it becomes, it's a little unwieldy, right? Like we have this subscription mm -hmm. for that software and we have that software and we have this email tool. And then we decide to try a different email tool and we don't cancel the first one just in case we're gonna keep the second, you know, we're not gonna keep the second one and we end up keeping them both and we only use one. And it's like a, a habitual truth, you know? Yeah. 
Um, yeah. And I, th- I think part of it, uh, Arya, is that is that the the bottom line is is it's unsexy and boring to a lot of people because you know driving deals and all of that is great uh, is more exciting. But the problem is that uh, at the end of the day, if you if you can't sell something at a price and deliver it at a at a lower cost to make your profit, then it doesn't really matter. You're always going to be chasing sales because your expenses are always going to be outpacing you. So having that actually making streamlining your business and making that bottom line as tight as it can be for me is always a, a great starting point. Yeah, no, for sure. And and there's no reason you can't can't drive both levers, yeah. right? Like drive extra sales or you know cut costs or do both. Or you can even just start to raise your prices, right? Yeah. Like if you're if you're able to shave uh, 10% on the cost side and increase sales price, not even uh, you know vol- volume and velocity, yeah. but just the pricing by 10%, by definition, you're gonna drop 20% to the bottom line there. Um, so it doesn't have to be an either or, it can always be a both. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and the other thing too, I think is um, with businesses sometimes is that, uh, is that um, maybe they don't give themselves enough runway and think that things are going to happen faster than they happen. I think this is a common problem is, um, and maybe they lose some faith in the business or they become overwhelmed or whatever, because things aren't happening quite as fast as they would like them to. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think w- what's the saying something of we overestimate what we could do in one year and underestimate what we could do in 10. Right. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think people expect, you know, you turn around and it's already, we're like three quarters away through September and you're like, where'd 2021 go, right? Like we were all exactly. busy focused living 2020 in what the p- pandemic was, but wow, 2021 disappeared on you and you thought you could, you know, whatever, do something huge in this third quarter. And next thing you know, the mm-hmm. third quarter is over in a couple, it is in a week, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and so the, yeah. the, the, the other thing, um, and you probably agree with this is that, um, there's never been a greater time, though, or greater access to resources, right? Whether you go through Upwork and get global resources from across the world or whatever, but there's never been a better time to being able to just slot in and out resources as you need them for specific tasks and all of that, and to run a more efficient organization that way. So in, in some ways, like this is a fantastic opportunity and a great time for people with their own businesses. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think if you go back five years, 10 years, the world, I know it sounds silly, but like the world was a different place. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, just thinking about the access to everything that you have on your phone today, when, you know, the iPhone first came out, you go back to like what the iPhone three or whatever it was, was called. I mean, what it looked like this, that's 10 generations ago of an iPhone. It was a totally different thing. Now you can literally run an entire organization from the palm of your hand. Um, so I, I definitely think the resources and, and the access today is, is tremendously different. And the same goes for, um, you know, when talking about building your net worth, if you start to see success, one, one of the things I see, the mistakes I see that people make is going back to the initial point of like, hey, I got to grow, I got to grow, I got to grow. Some people um, are always, they're coached to reinvest constantly in the business, grow the business, grow the business, grow the business. And they don't necessarily take the time to think about, okay, if I pull out, let's say I reinvest, you know, whatever, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70% of my yeah. profits back into the business, whatever the number is. But if I do take a distribution on the remainder, what am I doing with that money? How is that money growing? Because the mistake I see people make is what I, what I call it is they have this mantra of, build a business, then invest the profits or then invest. And I believe that it should be actually build a business and while you're building a business, invest in, in your future as well. Yeah, mm-hmm. you may see, you may have the ability to knock it out of the park with your business. You may see a higher ROI on those dollars, but keep in mind, you are tied to this one asset now. And if it doesn't go the way you want or the liquidity is later than you expected, you've lost a lot of time from investing in your personal future or whatever you want to be doing with that money later um, from not investing at day one. 
Yeah, and I think uh, that's obviously probably a lesson, unfortunately, that a lot of people learned in, in a very painful way during the pandemic when when businesses got impacted in different ways and some you know went out of business and all of that. So I, I would say that that's a fantastic uh, piece of advice because it, it, you know things changing so quickly and then with these uh, you know calamities that seem to come along more often than not now, uh, you have to have you have to kind of have a balanced approach. Yeah, no, for sure. I, I think it's interesting because some people thrived right in the pandemic. Yeah, certain sure. businesses like totally thrived and certain businesses definitely suffered. Um, and, you know, like you said, people lost a lot where they were riding on that for certain things in the future. Um, and, and it's interesting because uh, when I've had people come to me and they're thinking about investing in real estate or they're thinking about, hey, how do I deploy this capital into whatever asset class, real stock, crypto, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll take a look at their business. I'm like, oh, your business is very healthy. I think you should be investing. And then their business coach will be like, no, you have to grow your business. Don't invest in anything. And I'm like, listen, you know, you could do whatever you want. I'm not going to sure. force you to invest in an asset class. And I'm not going to force you not to reinvest in your business. It's your call. And yeah, you may see a phenomenal ROI on your Facebook ads today, but, you know, just understand that your business may see some massive impact where you didn't see it coming. And if you had just taken some of the money off the table and not grown it, and, and that's like, and I think that's like a small business owner's challenge, right? Like if you're, if you're running like a real, uh, lack of a better word, a, a real corporation, it's a whole different, you know, discussion, but sure. where you are the sole proprietor, right. And you own basically hundred percent of the equity. It's, it's this balance of like, what are you doing and, and how do you want to get to where you want to go? And it goes back to this whole thing is what are your destinations? Yeah, no, because it reminds me of um, of somebody who who I knew a number of years ago who started uh, an online uh, tobacco business, especially uh, chewing tobacco and all of that. You know, did did a roaring trade with the they were number one in search engines. Did a roaring trade with the military in particular, in particular and they were exploding. And then overnight, uh, Congress uh, passed a law to say you couldn't put tobacco through the mail. It couldn't mail. be delivered and all of that. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, the, I mean, he actually pivoted to cigars and ended up like with an even better business. But that's just an example of how the how you can have a great business and suddenly it's gone or it's changed yeah. or the landscape's changed. So always being focused on hyper growth, uh, as you said, is probably not the greatest idea. I mean, you have to have a balanced approach. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So what would be one other piece of advice you would give to people today, either business or personal? Um, yeah, so I think uh, sticking on the business side, I think it really comes down to understanding, like if you have a partnership or if you have a partner, um, putting agreements in place. So I, I know a lot of people, you know, they, they get into business. Sometimes it's a little bit loose. It's a little bit fast and, you know, fast and loose because like, Hey, this is my buddy. Hey, whatever. And you have to remember like legal agreements and partnership agreements. These are all done for when things don't go well. And we all want to believe that everything's going to go well all the time, but these documents protect everybody later. They also help um, in the, the standpoint of if I want to sell my ownership to you, right? Like having the idea of what we would call like a buy sell agreement where I could buy from you or you, I could sell to you. And you basically agree upon a subscribe methodology. It's not about a number. But it's just like, hey, this is how we're going to think about it. Because when I tell people, if you're if you're thinking about selling a business, there's typically two categories things fall in under. Okay, there's the um, there's a financial buyer who's going to buy your asset, your business, whatever it is, and they're looking for a financial return. So they're going to operate it or have you operate it. But let's say they mm -hmm. pay ten million dollars, they're going to look to sell it for fifteen or twenty down the road. Yep. And then you have the category of strategic buyers where it's a bigger competitor of yours or a bigger company that you fill a need that they have. And, and if you're in, let's say, you know, physical products, you fill a niche or you serve a specific customer base that they don't have, or they really want to speak to that vertical. And the strategic buyers typically will pay a much higher price because they're not looking for a financial return the same way the, the financial buyer yeah. is. They have a financial return like, hey, we are going to get efficiencies. We manufacture this already. We could just plug you in. Or we are selling 
eighth services in our sales force. And now you are a ninth service that we're just going to sell in our suite of services. And so they look at it from a very different perspective. So a buy sell agreement, when you, when you're, when you have a partner says, Hey, listen, these strategic acquisitions are really nice, but if I'm going to buy it from you, you're going to buy from me. Let's, let's say that that's not the value we're going to use. Yeah. We're going to use more of what I would call like a financial buyer or a market comparable, right? Like what mm -hmm. it would a willing buyer pay for a comparable business. And usually you're using like a financial buyer type of approach, meaning I know that I'm going to buy this for the future cash flow, but I'm ultimately going to try and sell it in some way, mm -hmm. shape or form. Yeah, no, I think those are great. That's a great piece of advice. Uh, yeah, good contracts are your friends. Um, and especially as if as you said, if you've gone into business with people you know, or your buddies or your family or whatever, um, it's much, much better to have everything, you know, ticked and tied before you go rather than trying to deal with it later. So that's great, great piece of advice. Okay, uh, all of Aria's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Yeah, sure. So um, I um, I have a couple of e-commerce businesses and I, you know, consult for a lot of different things, but the, my day job, my day in and day out job actually is um, I advise large private equity firms and hedge funds on the value, how to value a business, what the value of a business is, including their investments. So it doesn't have to be strictly um, an entire business. It could be a partial ownership in, in it, or it could be a debt piece, uh, like if they lent to these businesses. And so in dealing with all these different businesses, and in addition to like helping people like increase the value of their business, um, a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with knowing what to do with their their invest you know their money for their investments on their personal side um, so I work with a lot of entrepreneurs who are seeing success but want to really focus on their businesses not their their personal wealth but they want it to be thought of um, so I'm not like a broker registered advisor right. but I do um, you know advise um, primarily entrepreneurs and small small business owners on having access to different um, investment types of things or at least explaining or mapping out for their future where they want to go based on you know the roadmap that they want um, you know and so that's really primarily what what I advise uh, small business owners and entrepreneurs on Excellent. And as I said, all Aria's information will be below this video and links to find out more uh, about him and what he does. Fantastic advice. Thank you so much. There's so many great insights in here. And as Aria, as you said earlier, sometimes maybe you're hearing it for the first time, maybe you're hearing it for the 20th time, but now may be the right time to put that piece of advice into action. So again, thank you. My name is John Golden. I'll see you for another interview really soon. Thank you.